What a vote. What do I do, Carson? My guy. How are y'all? Mediocre? Below average? Subpar? Where y'all at? Yeah? Alright. Cool. Um, today, today we're talking about Psalms. And um, I'm excited about it. Like, I'm really excited about it. So we're going to do like a three-week series. And we have three different speakers for those three weeks. Uh, so you guys don't just have to listen to me the whole time. Uh, you're going to get to hear from one Mr. Stephen Sprague, missionary extraordinaire, uh, and also from one Mr. Jonathan Pausma. Yeah. You know, if you take Pausma and, like, rearrange the letters in it, it spells a psalm. So who better? Who better to preach on the psalms? My guy. Um, yeah, so what my um, heart was, I don't know, God put this on my heart, like, months ago he's like psalms and so whenever whenever i was like orchestrating the whole like you know series for the rest of the year that card you guys got when i was like setting that up like it was just like psalms has to be there somewhere i don't know where but it needs to and so like that was the whole process i, I don't know why but i'm just trying to listen to god so first question what do you guys think of when you hear the word psalm or psalms hmm Poems, okay, what else? Songs, hymns, what else? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Hmm? Daniel, okay, what else? Okay, those are good. So um, the Psalms, they are poems, and they are also songs, and they are also hymns, uh, but their they're like primary is like poetry. So it's like poetry first, and then it's used as what it was like kind of developed into is like sometimes they would use those poems as songs, because if you think about poems, like poems work well, like rhyming, whatever, like musically, it like makes sense. So they would take it, put it to music a lot of times, and they'd be like, okay, cool, got poems, got music, got hymns, right? But that's not the origin of it. Like, or also, one of the things that's like a common belief, which rightfully so. A common belief about Psalms is it's just this like random collection of these like poems or hymns, like a hymn book, where it's like, you know, hymn books, does anybody know what a hymn book is? Like you open up the book and then you started like the, oh man, like that's the whole concept. And so it's like this like random mashup of like poetry, but that's not what Psalms was designed to be. Psalms is like this actual, like, it's actually a very, very beautiful book. And while it is like a loose collection of things, it's not, um, it's not a mess. It's not, it still has order. So usually where like Bible stories or the books of the Bible, they might like go in sequential order. So from chapter to chapter, you're taking one step, then the next step, all moving towards the common goal of telling you whatever that book has to say. Psalms is like this random like throwing of these like stories out there. And like when you're looking at them, it's hard to tell because you go from one to the, to the next. You don't. You, it's hard to tell what the overarching story is. But like when you back up, it's like those. Um, have you guys heard of like um, picture mosaics, where it's like you take all these individual pictures and then like when you put them together and then back up, you can see the the bigger picture, right? And it's like oh, like when you're zoomed in, it just looks like random mess. But when you back up, you see that there's something going on. Does that make sense? Another way I've heard Psalms be described is like a symphony. Uh, same thing you got all these like random instruments that are telling like one story and it's like solos and it's like over here and it's like this this big story but you have these like individual instruments that are like telling that story so that is what the psalms are and that is what we're getting into for the next three weeks and i'm really excited to go into the psalms with you guys can any of my athletes do we have any athletes in here athletes please raise your hand athletes can y'all go get bibles for everybody in the back use your athleticism wisely Take, go to the back, grab Bibles for everybody, bring them to everybody else, because we're a team. Athletes. Athletes!
Is it like see through whiteboards? Oh, I've seen, I've messed with those. Those are actually like, sometimes the technology is not strong enough and it's actually harder, like way harder. You know what I mean? I do want one of those like see through whiteboards, right? Like the clear ones. I saw, I saw this guy, there's this like preacher who he, he's, he's remarkable, but he writes, he'll get on the other side of the see through right whiteboard and he'll write backwards so that when you're reading it, you see it forwards, but he's writing the stuff backwards and he's not in the way like this because he's behind the whiteboard. It's insane. I don't know how he does it, but he's amazing. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. Good call. No, that's what we need. That's what we need. More yelling. Good call, everybody. Um, okay, so this is kind of the breakout of some Better? All right, cool. This is the breakout of Psalms up top. Um, so Psalms is actually five different books, technically. Um, if you go to the end of, if you go to chapter 41, chapter 72, chapter 89, or chapter 106, uh, you will find one, the same verse at the end of each of those chapters. It's going to say the same thing. I think it's, it says something along the lines of like, you know, let us all like praise the Lord. Like he is good and everlasting forever and ever. Amen. Um, but it says the same thing at the end of each of those chapters to denote like the different sections of it. And each section, each of these books kind of talks about a different thing. Have you guys seen uh, Avatar The Last Airbender? You know how there's like book one air and then there's the different episodes? Yes, that's what this is. It's like book one, air. Book one, water. Book two, air? Did he go to Earth? And there's only three books, right? And he doesn't have, he doesn't do book, I guess air. He knows air? Ew. Okay. <laughs> so, so here are our five books that Psalms are, that the Psalms, it's also called the Psalter. I'm going to give you guys a lot of facts, and then we're going to get into it. Uh, it's also called the Psalter. That's a thing that people say. Um, but it's, it's these five books broken out. There's 150 total psalms. In there, there's a, what is called, I'm pretty sure it's called an acrostic. I'm pretty sure. But it's where you start each uh, verse from uh, with a different letter of the alphabet. So it'd be like, all the people said amen, be cool, and then like, chill out. You know what I'm saying? You go down, the like, but it's the Hebrew alphabet. So it's like Aleph, Bet, Dalet, so on and so forth. Um, there's 150 total. There's actually an intro, which is chapters one and two. And then there's also even a conclusion. And it's just, it's like a, the design, fe these are all design features. So the conclusion of Psalms is the last like five, ch five chapters of the book. So ch chapters 146, 147, 148, which Miss Bella read for us today, or a verse of it, 149, 150. Those five are a conclusion and they all start and end with the words hallelujah, which means like, it's a command to praise God. That's what hallelujah means. It's like, yo, get up and say thank you to the Lord. Like that's what hallelujah means. It's saying like he is worthy of it. Let's praise him. So like there's a lot of like structural stuff going on with the Psalms. And there's like a lot of like it's, it's just it's more detailed and like magnificent than like what we first think of when we look at it. Um, and obviously we can't get into all 150 right now, but we're going to get into one of them. And I'm super excited. If you guys like if y'all will rock with me, if y'all will like be focused or whatever, not even be focused, but if you like give it, this is, this is probably one of my favorite songs, probably like top two favorite songs. And it's just beautiful. And it's not even like that this one is extraordinary amongst the others. It's just one that like, I've like been able to see, like God is like, like through commentaries and other preachers and stuff, I'm like able to see like how beautiful it is. I can appreciate it now. So like, that's this, um, <laughs> whenever I, I described the symphony thing earlier, whenever I was younger, uh, my dad, like, have you guys ever heard like saxophone being played like a sax solo? Like saxophone is like a really beautiful instrument. It sounds like really nice. My dad bought a saxophone more younger or when I was younger. And I remember when he bought it, like he, he didn't start practicing immediately. He bought it and it was just like this like piece of like instrument metal that was just in his like office and I remember like looking at it and just be like oh my this thing is amazing and he told me how expensive it was which was dumb expensive um and I, it's so expensive and I remember that like my thoughts were like yo this thing is so much more beautiful than I thought it was 
this thing is so much more intricate than I first knew. Because I was looking at it, every time I'd seen a, a saxophone, it was like on TV or something. Or like, my dad really liked jazz, he's weird. We would go to these like jazz concerts randomly as a family, not cool. But we would go to these jazz concerts and there would be like a dude playing saxophone, it was always from a distance. But when he bought it, I was like, yo, this is crazy. And I, was re I remember watching him trying to play it and like basically from being able to like look at it and get up close and personal, it made me appreciate saxophone all the more. And he was so bad. He was so bad at it. He never like practiced. He didn't have time to actually like practice and put the work in. So he was like really bad. So like that made me appreciate like good saxophone players even more. So all that being said, we're going to look specifically at one of those psalms. It's the center psalm of that like conclusion. Psalm 148. It's in the middle. It's 146 through 150. 148 is right in the middle, which is also important, but we can't get into that. Um, but we're going to look into this one specifically. And so first off, let's just read it. And so what we're going to do, this is like listening to that saxophone solo without having looked at the sax, without like really knowing what it looks like. Let's just like listen. Y'all good? Y'all with me? All right, cool. <clears throat> Starting at verse one. Praise the Lord. That's hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord for the for he commanded and they were created and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. This is the second half now. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all the deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above heaven and earth, or earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Okay. So when we listen to that, like I said, it's kind of like listening to that like solo that first time. And you're like, oh, this sounds like really cool. But like when you start to like dig into it, you're going to find that there's like so many more intricacies going on in that instrument than what we first see. Does that make sense? We're zooming into that picture from the mosaic. So the, 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 the mosaic showing us the big picture, and then we zoom into one photo, and now we're just going to like take our time to appreciate it. Does that sound good? Okay, the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at two things. There's going to be two things that are going on in our individual picture, all right, two particular subjects. And one of them is like the, the like far off, and one of them is like personal. One of them is um, this uh, interesting kind of concept the other one is like actually like life changing. Uh, one is the heavens and the other is earth. Okay, so we're going to look at the two subjects of this poem, this particular psalms. It's the heavens and the earth. So when I say heavens and earth, what do you guys think of? Does that trigger anything when you hear heavens and the earth? Hmm. Creation, creation, Genesis, chapter one. Right? Does that make sense? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This particular like psalmist, right? He, whatever point he's trying to make, he wants to link back in the whole like the creation story. He wants to say, hey, you guys know the whole like, you know, day one, God was like making stuff. God created the heavens and the earth. Let's talk about it. Let's get into it. And this is why we want we want to talk about praise. So he's leaking praise with creation right off rip. OK, so what we're going to do on this whiteboard here is we're going to look at the what, the where, the who, and the why. So it's from this psalm, what does God want? Or what does the psalmist want, right? Where is, we'll, and it'll make more sense later, where things are happening, who, like these, these psalm, or this particular psalm is talking to, and then the why. So I told you guys it's broken up into two different sections. So we got verses 1 through 6 is one section, and then 7 through 14 is a different section. So we're going to look at 1 through 6. And then 7 through 14. So, right off rip, guys, what does the psalmist want? Okay, that's okay. Help us understand. 
He wants us to praise the Lord. He says it like all over that thing. The, he's like, yo, sh shut up and praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. It's this command. It's a command. Praise God. Give him the respect that he deserves. Glorify his name. Praise him. So our what, real big, is praise. Our what is praise. That's what is desired with this psalm. Okay? What is our, let's get into our, like, where. I also talked, we talked about this. What are our two, basically, realms or location? We got the far off and the personal. We got the, like, the, the like interesting. And then we've got the, like, it's about me. This is going to be, like, just life-changing. So what are our two realms or our two locations? Heaven and earth. Okay, so let's look at this. Guys, this is like, I love this. This is like, it's ridiculous. All right. So look at the first uh, couple verses. So he says, praise the Lord. Praise him from the heavens. So he's like, that's my location. Now we're getting into the who, okay? The who is all his angels, all his hosts. Not just those individuals, right? Because hosts, not to get into that, but hosts is like these like uh, heavenly beings, right? So there's like angels, but there's also like just heavenly beings that biblically in the Old Testament, like they exist. We're not going to get into that. If you want to talk about that, we can talk about that later at a different time. But this is a whole like can of worms thing. But basically, he's saying anything that exists in the heavenly realm, any angel, any, any, any one of his hosts, praise the Lord, right? And then it goes into the sun and the moon. It goes into shining stars. It goes into all these things that God put in place in creation. So, so one of the like little fun facts, interesting things, every single day of creation from Genesis is written in this psalm. Like every day. And multiple, uh, a few of them are mentioned multiple times. So like the sun and stars is like day two, or yeah, day two. The chaos that's mentioned a little bit later, which we'll get into it, is like kind of the chaos from day zero where God hasn't started creating yet. And there was like the earth was formless and void. And so when you go through this psalm, you will see if you like pay attention and you go back to Genesis, you will see God referencing each day or the psalmist referencing each day in this psalm. because He's trying to say like, hey, everything. Not just some things. I'm talking about the creatures too. I'm talking about I'm talking about the stars. I'm talking about and the only thing that doesn't fit in our understanding of that creation are these heavenly beings. This like these angels and these hosts. And so what this is saying is like, it's like, okay, cool. Heaven is filled with stars and sun and moon and all of these like beautiful things that God hung into place. But heaven is also filled with these things that we don't have our mind wrapped around as humans, right? Does that make sense? We don't, we don't know where they go in our creation story. They don't fit within, typically, our understanding of, of like what we see. You guys don't see any angels around here, but biblically it says there's angels around here. Does that make right? So it's like we don't have our mind wrapped around this thing, but what the psalmist is saying is like, that don't matter. Who cares? Like those things that we don't have our mind wrapped around, they bow down to the Most High God. Let them praise the Lord. And then it gives us our reason. So let me... Write down the who. So what all do you see? You guys see for the who? Angels. What else? Hmm? Well, who is being called to praise? We're being called to praise God, but who is being called to praise in these first few verses? The host. Okay. Yep. Sun and moon. Yep. Anything else? Highest heavens. We're going to go up. Go up higher. Go up the highest you can go and have that praise of the Lord. High. The waters above the heavens. That's something else that's mentioned in our creation story where God says, it says it's, it's called a firmament in Genesis. Again, weird concept. But basically there was these waters and God separated the waters from the waters is what it says. And there's this firmament over the earth. A lot of times that's viewed as just like, like clouds that are like, you know, there's water in our sky. But like, Anyway, again, not another thing we're going to get into it because it's a whole other like, can of worms. But uh, the firmament is what we'll say. Now, it says all these things need to praise God. All these things, it's commanded. It's saying, hey, praise God. Hey, praise God. Hey, praise God. Hey, praise God. Now let's get into the why. Why does it command these things to praise the Lord? It says to the heavens, it says, you should praise him in verse 5. Praise the name of the Lord for he commanded 
and they were created. He established, I'm sorry, he established them for, uh, forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. So it says like, hey heavens, hey you highest reaches, hey you beings that we can't even wrap our heads around. Hey angels, hey everybody up there, hey stars, hey sun and moon, this is why you should praise God. You should praise God because he commanded it and then it was. He commanded you and then you were. He brought you into existence. Hey sun and moon, hey stars, hey all of you things. You should praise God because he established you in your place. He gave you like a purpose and an existence. Hey sun, moon, stars, like when we look at you, you should praise God because he set up a decree. And uh, when you think of decree, think of like law, right? God set a law in place. And this is really calling to how the stars uh, are always where they're supposed to be. Uh, they're they're this, these objects in the sky that we we can uh, we get direction from. The, in ye olden days, we used to get direction from the like North Star and stuff. Uh, we know where they're going to be and we can kind of judge our life off of them. They bring us seasons, right? And so this concept is like, man, there's this insane amount of order in our world, this insane amount of just structure in our world, and God decreed it. That's actually where we get concepts like, have you guys heard of the law of physics, law of gravity, law of thermodynamics? All of those, all of those terms, law, they imply that there's a lawmaker. They're called laws because it's as if someone came in and someone said, this has to be this way. That they run on such a perfect system, it's as if there's a lawmaker above those things, making sure that gravity is always working. Making sure that heat is always transferred. Making sure that the stars and the moon, the sun, is always working and these seasons are always changing and everything is going exactly as planned and it has nothing to do with us. We can't even wrap our heads around these, these hosts and these angels, but they are where they're supposed to be doing what they're supposed to do because God decreed it. Praise the Lord. Does that make sense? Give him praise. Give him praise. Okay, so the second part, that, that's, like the, that's like there's so much that's going on there, but that's our like far off thing. It's like, dang, man. Like the sun and the moon, the stars, angels, hosts, geez, but still praise the Lord. This is about us, this second half, okay? So we're going to look at it again. So it's still the same. People, earth, praise him. Where? Earth. Now, who? what's our who? You guys look through it. Tell me who we're talking to in this. Ooh, let me, I'm going to do a little like zigzag around those guys. Okay, C. Sea monster. See, that's a Luca reference. Sea monsters and deeps. What else? Fire, hail, snow, mist. Okay, what else? Mountains, hills. Okay. The wild animals. What else? Wait, what? Neither of the two people that spoke at the same time spoke when I said what. And then a third person spoke. And you can see how that's confusing for me. Wind. Kings. Okay, Ooh. kings, rulers, Ooh, we're going to put a, like a little special thing around them too. Kings, rulers, what else? Maidens, and what was that, isn't there one more? Huh? Maidens, is that everybody? Young men, the children, and the old folks. We'll call them senior citizens. Seniors. Okay, guys. So this is our who. So we're gonna like we're gonna bracket these real quick, and we're gonna look at these. Okay. So you got mountains and hills. In let me back up. In creation. So God is this awesome God. It says that God looks at the chaos at the beginning of time. God is looking at the chaos of the earth, and he's like, man, this thing is a mess. This thing is formless and void. This thing is deep and messy. And he says, you know what I need to do? I need to bring order to it. So God, I'm setting my phone on airplane mode so it doesn't blow up here. So God, in his goodness, is like, I'll sort all this out for him. I'll set things where they go. 
I'll make it beautiful. I'll make it perfect. I'll make it good, 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 very good, humans. Very good. I'll do that. And so God does that. And then the humans step in. And what do humans do? Mess it up immediately. That's our thing. We mess it up. So humans mess up his created order. And by messing up his created order, we throw creation into like into the into our mess. So when we bring sin, sin comes into the earth again. So the things that God made beautiful and made orderly and, and, and perfect, they're now chaotic again. Right. And so there's a result of that. There are consequences to that in our world. Right. There are consequences to that. And some of those consequences are these monsters and these deeps, these like fire, hail, snow and mist. The like the Hebrew language that it's using for all this is talking about these chaotic, destructive things that have come into our world. Uh, that fire word is actually like lightning. I think you guys might even have a, a little like note for it. It's talking about all the things that would take God's created order and try to destroy them, try to like throw them out. Right. So you get very real real quick. OK. When we're looking out into our world, we're looking out into this earth, right? And like, let's let's just put all people to the side real quick. Our world has hurricanes. Our world has these tornadoes. Our world has like chaos. And so we're looking at our world and we're like, man, like from what I understand, God created these things. But at the same time, there's all this ugly stuff that's happening. There's a bunch of like ugly, destructive things happening. So like, how am I supposed to look at that and say, well, like God is good and God has done all these things. It's like, well, first of all, you did that. We're humans. We messed it up. But second of all, it says that he's the one that still keeps those things in check. He keeps those things at bay. So all the chaos that you can bring to this world, all the sin that you can bring to your personal life, it does not matter. There might be consequences to it, but it's not outside of God's control. And so the psalmist wants us to think of that like right now. He says right off rip, hey, look at the chaos. Look at the ugly things. Look at the mess. Look at the broken stuff in our world. Let it praise God. Let it praise him. It is not bigger than him. It is not more than him. It is not outside of his created order. It actually says that it still respects his word. There's a level of control that our father still has over this chaos that we've brought into this world. So let it praise God. Does that make sense? Right after that, we get into like all these other things that like we're not going to call them like sinless, but like some of the things that God did create that make sense. These are back to our Genesis stuff, or back to our Genesis stuff. It's talking about mountains and hills. It's talking about the wild animals, the, the livestock and these creatures. It's talking about creeping things. Right. So it's talking about things that God actually brought into the world. So it's like first there's the chaos and it checks the chaos and it has chaos. Praise God. Then it's like the, the things that God did create, the things that make sense within the, within the created order. It's like, hey, all you things, will you praise God? God made you. God made you to praise him, made you to give him the honor that he deserves and respects him. And then it gets to our last section of all these people. And with people, you got to have this like mix. You have this mix of like the chaotic stuff from that first section and the beautiful creative stuff from that second section. Because you have people who are the ones that brought the chaos and bring the chaos. We're the mess, right? We're the mess. But we're also this created order. So with people, you see both extremes. You see people that are like this beautiful picture of like God and creation and like being made in his image. But you also see monsters. You see the, the villains. You see the wicked men. You see like rapists and murderers. You see the worst of our people. And we have to look at all of it. And the psalmist is showing us all of it. And this, this psalmist is still saying, let those things too praise God. Okay. And so for that, we need a good reason. We need a very good reason. Why would chaos praise God? Why would, why would wicked people, mankind all together, why would they praise God? You know, it might make sense, the, like, the things that he created that are exactly doing what he wants them to do, the animals and the mountains and all that. All right, that might make sense, but, but what about these wicked things? What about the mess? Why do those things praise God? Guys, this is verses 13 and 14. This is what Bella read earlier. It says, let them, and it's, at this point it's talking about everything in the earth. It says, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. So of all the things that we've like addressed, all the things that we've looked at, all the, like, all the people, right? All of the things that would be high up, they are not higher than the most high God, right? Kings, rulers, young men, old men, all of that. None of those things, even within their most extreme, even the most Hitlery Hitler that you can get, it does not go above the most high God. His name alone is exalted. 
He is by himself on that pedestal. Does that make sense? The second one. It says, his majesty is above earth and heaven. That word majesty is like beauty. It's like wonder. His, how beautiful he is, is above earth and heaven. So think, all of the ugly things, all the things that don't make sense. Because uh, within the, like, the angelic realm that we talked about, you have like Satan and demons, because they also fall within that same category. All the things that don't make sense to us, all the things that are ugly and messy, all the sin, all of the destruction, all of that ugly, ugly, terrible stuff. His majesty is above that. How beautiful our God is outweighs the sin and the ugly things that we bring into play, that this world brings into play. The psalmist is saying, like, this is, this, if anything, right? All of this is like, dude, I do care about how you feel. I really do. But legit, shut up. None of that stuff is bigger than God. Nothing that you bring to the table can compete with God. Nothing is high enough. Nothing is, nothing is low enough. Nothing is ugly enough. Like God's too beautiful for that. Nothing is strong enough and like dominating enough because God's too high. His name alone is exalted. You get it? You guys get it? It's saying like, shut up. Praise him. He's more. He's more. And then our last one. 14. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. This is weird. This is odd. Everything else has been like pretty linear, right? Everything else has been pretty like logical. But this moment, after we're talking about all of creation, for some reason, we come back down to the word, to a horn, which, what? We come back down to a horn. And then from a horn, we then go down to Israel specifically, which I don't know if you guys have seen a map. Sometimes when we read the Bible, it makes Israel seem like this like larger than life thing. Israel is like a blip. It's this itty bitty country. And so within this itty bitty country, there's a horn for his people. These, these people are his people. And for that reason, everything should praise the Lord. That doesn't follow like logic by what we would look at. But again, the whole mosaic thing, the whole symphony thing, this is us needing to like back up and look at the bigger picture, right? Within Psalms, there's other places where it talks about this, uh, the, uh, the horn concept, right? And then like outside of just the Psalms, it's a thing, it happens in Samuel, um, where it's talking about this horn concept. And, and like the picture is, if you have like two bulls, two rams, two horned animals and they're fighting, right? They're going into battle. And after one of them is victorious, it like lifts its head proudly and its horn is lifted up, right? So the picture that like God is painting, he's saying like, hey, Israel is like in this battle. So this is all metaphor, poetry, beautiful stuff. Israel's in some kind of battle and they have a horn of victory and, and God is the one that like lifts Israel's head up. And for that reason, the whole world should praise him. Well, when you like, like I said, when you back up outside of that picture and you look at the story that the whole Bible is telling, you look at the story that the Psalms are telling multiple times over and over. They're trying to talk to you about this Messiah character. They're trying to talk to you about this Jesus character. We're trying to talk to you about the one who is anointed, who is coming, who will make things better. So when you talk about the reason that the whole earth should praise the Lord, it goes back to Genesis where God was saying like, hey, Abraham, through you, all the nations are going to be blessed. It goes back even further in Genesis where it says, like, hey, hey, serpent, your head will be crushed and his heel will be bruised. But your head will be crushed. There's this battle. And the like really interesting part of this isn't that it's saying, like, because Israel was able to lift its own horn. That's not what happened. It says because the Lord has raised up a horn. The Lord is the one who raised up this horn for Israel. So victory wasn't brought by their own might and their own power. It wasn't brought by their own like ability to conquer the problem, to conquer death, sin, the grave. It was brought by God, who was able to lift the horn of this people. So our like worship guys, y'all can come up, y'all um, do your thing. Um, guys, this uh, this concept, the reason like I said, I said like this is this like beautiful thing to me. Um, this concept, the reason I think it matters so much or the reason I like look at it and I'm kind of, I don't know, just taken back. 
is because like as we look at the rest of the Bible, as we look at the rest of these stories, the idea of something being lifted, right, in victory is always like associated. So the people of Israel, they're, they're associating this like lifting and victory to this glorious thing. So all through the Psalms, you're going to see that. All through like different parts of the Bible, you're going to see that. It's like the people in the Old Testament are looking for this victory. They're looking for this king. They're looking for this anointed one. They're looking for the win. But it didn't come like that. Because God is God and because God had this plan, he, he, he stuck to that other Genesis story where it says like the, the, the seed of the woman, the heel of that individual would be bruised. And so what it looks like isn't this like victorious, beautiful like raising of this horn. It was actually this ugly raising of this horn. It was this, uh, this victory that was brought by raising up this Jesus on this cross, right? To die for the sins of all mankind. So that like by confession of like our life for him and his life for ours, we could be with this most high God. And so that all the nations could praise him, so that all creation could praise him, so that the sun and the moon and the stars and, and all the wicked people and all the chaos, all of those things could praise him because he was lifted up. And then he dies, and then he's lifted up again. And then by that relationship with him, we're lifted up. This is, this is something different. This is designed to be something like revolutionary. Our God, through the Psalms, even in these like random poems, is trying to say, I have a plan for you, and I have a focus for you, and I want your life, and I want it to be made whole. I want you to be free. Will you accept my son? Will you accept the horn that I lifted up? Does that make sense? Let's pray. Father, um, you are more than we can imagine on a daily basis, Father. Since the dawn of time, you have been magnificent. You have been more. You have been ridiculous, Lord. I pray that we would be a people that starts to see that and appreciate that, God. I pray that we would be a people that like honors you for that. I, I pray that God would. I remember being young and how hard it was to just give you praise. I remember how hard it was just to tell people that I was a Christian. I remember how hard it was to worry about like singing a song. I remember how hard it was to just glorify you, to be loving, to be a, a peace bringer, a peacemaker. To be somebody who you called me to be, it was so difficult on a daily basis to do that. But you never stopped being worthy. And I know that I took my eyes off of the fact that you are worth that, God. And so like now, tonight, but also just as we go through the Psalms in general, God, I ask that you would just pull our eyes back to the fact that you are worthy. You would pull us back to the concept, shut up and praise the Most High God. He is more than enough. Jesus' name.